Thank you for reminding me to relax in this very stressful season. Uh, I don't know if all of you know, but in less than two weeks, my commissioning paperwork is due. So the Board of Ordained Ministry will be evaluating me in less than um, two weeks. So I am in crunch time. Uh, and uh, I just need that reminder uh, to relax and breathe. Uh, so uh, in the midst of that, uh, this week we'll be talking about financial stewardship and Christian mission. Hey. Yay. <laughs> That's what I uh, call it today. Um, so I just kind of wanted to first ask the question, what are people's initial reactions when I say financial stewardship and Christian mission? What are people's initial thoughts? What's come into your brain right now? Fun drive. <laughs> drive. That's a good one. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Debbie, did you have something you wanted to share? You're muted. Oh, geez. Okay. Money. Money. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting word because like I was looking it up this week and stewardship in the Greek actually doesn't mean financials fully. It means taking care of one's household. Mm -hmm. So it's like finances are connected to it somehow, which we in the church have always said, you know, oh, it's about financials and how we're supposed to be good stewards of our own congregations and things like that. But it's actually a much bigger word. And um, kind of straining that to it kind of brought to mind, like, what does it mean to be people of this mission, right? In the United Methodist Book of Discipline, we say that Christ's mission is uh, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We put it in the nature of our, of our church, and it kind of alludes to what the Book of Matthew calls the Great Commission, right, where we're sent we're sent to go out. We're sent to be disciples of this wonderful man named Jesus Christ, who we call Savior. And at the end of it all, really, when we talk about stewardship, right, and we talk about all of our congregations and what, what lights get, get switched on, sometimes we think, how are these two actually connected? Why do these two things even matter? And so um, tonight's Bible passage uh, is going to be Mary's Magnificat, so Luke 1, 46 to 55. Uh, and I'm going to read through it a little bit, and then I'm going to ask for some more perspectives on what people think in relationship to this. All righty, so let me pull that up. And so it's this is called Mary's Song of Praise. And Mary said, My soul glorifies thee, O Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the uh, humble. He has filled the uh, hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Strong passage. There's a lot of things talking about the rich being sent away, the humble being lifted, the poor are front and center, and the mighty will fall. What are people thinking when they hear that? What are people reacting to when they hear that? That the Bible has that kind of strong language. Communism. What was that, Oscar? Communism. Communism. Hmm. That's an interesting one, right? 
within my own family, that's a very hot topic that we don't like to talk about. You know, my family comes from Cuba. And so when I, when they, when they hear that kind of word, it's just automatically like, no, that's not what God can, can be about. But it seems to be talking about that, right? It seems to be giving away our possessions, handing it to others, talks about lifting up the actual poor so that they're actually at the front and center. Does that mean communism or does it mean something that Jesus is actually doing something to radically equalize this world? The radical injustice that's, that's being talked about in Mary. It's a really good one, Oscar. I love that. Who else has something to add? I mean, in the vein of what Oscar said, um, I think what I hear is definitely a revolution of the status quo, where it is not, I mean, I feel like I want to ask more about the word charity because the way I think of the word charity or the way it's used is like, oh yeah, just give the poor some alms, but mm -hmm. not really changing where the focus of the love and the care is. That's a really good point. Yeah, there's been a major conversation between charity versus uh, systemic understanding of what the world should be. Uh, and that's a really good point to segue into even some of the politics that are going on today, right? We, we talk about that all the time. Do we just give charity to those that we like or that we don't like or that we need to get them out of our hair versus how we care for everyone around us? What do they actually need? Yeah, that's a really good one. And in that vein, right, you know, in the midst of COVID-19, right? How do we care for those that are desperately yearning for caring for their own neighbor, which is what Mary's talking about here, but also at the same part as well, kind of reflecting back on, I need this money so that my family can survive. It's a tough situation to be in. I mean, I've been hearing it all the time, you know, I want to give money, but I just can't. I have kids to feed. It's a very interesting dynamic when we talk about a, a mission of the ch church that's focused on caring radically for the person standing right in front of us. And Mary here is talking about something that I think is really interesting when she talks about herself as a humble servant. I think it's really important that as a humble servant, she's saying here, I'm not high, I'm not rich, I'm not this person that has all of this wealth and status. I'm here saying this as a person on earth. But this is what Jesus Christ stood for. This is what my son stood for. Uh, and I, it's interesting that when we go back to how Jesus talks about it in Matthew, in the Great Commission, we talk about a Jesus that's saying, go out into the world spreading my good news. The Greek in that, in that passage is talking about spreading, spreading the actual news of Jesus Christ. So many people love to um, identify that as a passage that's focused around um, kind of going out to different countries talking about Jesus. But maybe what Jesus is talking about is something a little bit more fundamental to what he was doing here on earth, bringing heaven to earth. And so when we talk a little bit about financial stewardship, right? I mean, she talks about bringing down the rich, hum, bringing up the, the poor. It's about this radical realignment of the entire world. It's a realignment that tells everyone on earth that Jesus is not here to tell you how to live your own life, but he's here to transform this world in this image that makes the world a better place, a more equal place, a more just place for everyone around. 
I love that Jesus. I love talking about that kind of Jesus. It stimulates me in so many different ways. But I want to I wanna give other people an opportunity to talk. I mean, you know, I've been talking a lot more than I, I like to talk. <laughs> so I'm going to give other people an opportunity. What are other people's thoughts about this? What are people thinking in this, in this vein? Or what are people thinking they want to ask more questions about? I guess I can speak up now. Um, uh, first of all, I was sort of surprised that this was the passage that we're going to be using uh, talking about uh, finance or talking about, because I typically, in my own mind, this is a song of, of praising the Lord for what, what he has provided. And I think maybe that is the starting point for our looking at what we can do, what our church can do, what we as in individuals can do, uh, starting with the abundance that we have. And I, I'm meaning abundance in a very general sense, not just financial abundance, but, but the resources that we have available to us, the human resources, the other kinds of material resources. So um, that you've put the Magnificat in a different light for me than what I typically think. And I was even reminded then of, of Job, which we studied earlier, uh, having all the things that happened to him, but in the end, God reminding him, look at all I've done for the, in, in this universe, in this world. And um, so putting, putting our eyes where they need to be on, on uh, doing, I'll just put it, God's work in this world is, I think, uh, is very, it's not only helpful, it's necessary. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I love that. I love that I was able to help with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's wonderful that you talk about it being as a perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really is a measure of God's call. I love how you, you talk about God's, God's call there, because I think that that's a very important part to this, to this passage. This is a calling mm -hmm. because the book of Luke is about showing Jesus's prophetic message. Yeah. So it is all about that kind of conversation of God calling us into doing this type of work, going back to the actual prophets, going back to Job. When we actually talk about, you know, a radical realignment of this coming, God is, is coming, so repent. Um, I think that that's a very important part here, that there is a prophetic message that's clearly present there within Mary's praise and saying, we're called to do this type of work. We're called to love God this way, and we're called to love our neighbors this way. So I love the way that that was phrased. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else? Oscar, did you want to say something? Yes, uh, talking about money and God, it's like, a, it sounds fair that some, he has been blessing us. It's, it's in the human spirit to give back. When someone gives us to us, we want to give back to the person who's giving us. Like uh, if we got friends to help us, we are ready to help them. We're ready to give to our children, to, to give to the whoever we want to. When God gives us, is a thing is part of the man, or part of the people to give back to God. And God accept that. And I think is that uh, money is needed to uh, to keep the uh, the ministry, like uh, in all times, to keep the temple. It was necessary to get money to. To keep the 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 priests, to keep the Levites, and all that work they have to do. Nowadays, yeah. it's a slightly different, but uh, still, it's, it's God's work, and money is needed. And besides that, you give to back, you give to you give money to God, He gives you back blessings, more blessings. Mm. Thank you, Oscar. Oh. Thank you, thank you. I think. Uh, you know, it's interesting, right? You know, what we give out is what we can receive back as well. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's such a beautiful way to look at the way that we see God in terms of money, right? It's, it's, a, it's a big question mark. We need the money to move forward. <laughs> but yet at the same time, we're fighting for a world in which world where money should be necessary anymore. 
I've always found myself kind of wrestling with that question in regards to what is, what does the future of God's kingdom look like here? And why does it look this way? You know, if we're fighting for this, why are we still asking for it? Right. Um, but I think at the end of it, it's a really good way of looking at money, right? If we're going to, if we're going to ask for that money, we should be willing to give it back out. And as that money gets given back out, it comes back towards us in some ways because we're doing God's work. Might not be a physical one where we actually get more money inside of our coffers, but perhaps what that money is given out for is to do God's work to care about our own neighbors. And maybe at that point, right, we're being like Mary. We're being that humble servant that's saying, we're going to do Christ's, Christ's work. Sorry about that. No, no worries. I thought it was from me, so. <laughs> who else has, has something to add? Or who else would like to speak? Um, I have a comment. Um, and we, we knew ahead what you were doing, uh, speaking about today. Mandy told us yesterday, and I reminded myself to look at Wesley's opinion of this of stewardship. Um, and so basically, um, it just reminds us that nothing is ours. You know, it was all given and created for us. So um, we need to, we have it for, as he says, a season. Um, and we need to be um, mindful of taking care of everything he's put on this earth. So I think that encompasses um, a lot that we're involved in in the ministry. And of course, of loving one another. Um, but it, it was, um, it's just a reminder that, that nothing we have is ours. It's all given to us because he loves us. And in return, we need to love him by respecting it and caring for it, so. Matter of fact, two of Wesley's last sermons were on these two topics exactly. Uh, one was on capitalism and greed, and the other last one was on visiting the poor and the sick. So if you guys go through John Wesley's sermons, his two very last ones, I think something like two or four give and take, are those two sermons. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the reception of those two sermons within Methodist ministers at that time was very, very poor. People didn't like what John Wesley had to say on that. Right. Uh, and I find it interesting that John Wesley was pulling from this element of we have to be very, very careful about where the foundation of our money is going. Because when he talks about visiting the poor and visiting the sick, he's talking about the work that we're called to doing. Mm -hmm. When he talks about a form of churches that just want money for money's sake, it's not about the money. It's about the mission. It's about what Christ is calling us to do. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of really reflect on that. Debbie, thank you for bringing that forward because I reflect on how maybe John Wesley would have talked about Mary being a humble servant mm -hmm. and wondering how he would respond to that. And I'd like to think that he would say, we are all called to be humble servants in the sight of God, doing God's work that really means caring for our neighbors as ourselves. And that's not easy to do, it's really not. I mean, thinking about it, right? You know, if I see a homeless person, do I really wanna help? Or is there something in me that's saying, I still don't know enough to go help that person? It's hard, it's hard to give up our finances in some ways or commit to a mission that says we're here to build money for these communities. Sometimes I don't understand it. Sometimes I don't feel it in my heart of hearts. Sometimes I'm not fully encapsulating what that means or what that even looks like. So what are my, what are my next steps? But in the end, I think that if Wesley can do it, we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oscar. I have a question about Wesley. I have a, a, a in the in the in the computer. They have a commentary about the Bible from Wesley. Is that mm -hmm. a 
is that Wesley's commentary exactly from him or is somebody else? Or is that the oh. name of the, the commentary? What's the name of the commentary? Wesley's commentaries on the Bible. In every single paragraph in the Bible is, is a comment. And it's kind of all English. That it's sounds kinda, like kind of weird. That sounds like Wesley. Okay. Uh, I want to be sure. Like uh, Wesley was very well known for preaching sermons that lasted like a good two hours on one single passage. So he, I, it would not surprise me that Wesley had a, a whole commentary on that. I haven't heard about it. Mandy, am I correct that he did write one or that he did have one? So um, it, you'll know that uh, the reason we're called Methodists is because John Wesley's like literal methodology um, was really rigorous. He would rise early in the morning to pray to meditate, um, to reflect on scripture. And he was very, very well educated. So it was, a uh, he, he had his own translations, uh, both of the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament. And um, the preaching resource that I use is called Text Week. And it's a, it's a website that's been around since the dawn of time. I mean, it literally looks as old as the internet. Um, <laughs> they're, they're currently <laughs> redoing it, but it's on like a dot matrix printer, essentially, that's just posted online. Um, <laughs> that was a joke for three people. Uh, Text Week is marvelous. And they include not only translations, but commentaries, including Wesley's. So every week there is a link to, you know, this is what John Wesley might have said about these particular passages. And Oscar, just like you said, sometimes they're really thoughtful. Sometimes they're really insightful. Um, sometimes the, the wisdom is a little dated. You can tell it comes from the late 1700s. Um, but I found it really enriching to see how consistent some of those thoughts can be. So yeah, it sounds like you've got Wesley's commentary. Uh, they're called explanatory notes, not yeah. commentary. Yeah. Mm. And that's how I've heard it. That's how I've heard it. Notes. Yeah, that's. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah, I mean, Wesley was a really interesting character. Wesley was very, very biblical. And from the beginning of his uh, journey in, in faith, um, I've always been astounded at how beautiful he's been very, very consistent with a lot of his themes of where God's, God's love resides. Um, and that's really was one of the things that separated him from a lot of the different uh, folks at that time who were condemning him. So that's that's a really, really good point. Thank you. Who else has something to add or wants to say something? Go for it, Oscar. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I've been thinking about how the kingdom of God talks about the future that economics of the future that everybody is going to have his own house, his own tree, his own banger, which mm -hmm. means people is gonna, not going to work for somebody else. And mm -hmm. that is very different than what is going on right now. And I'm going to be honest with you. And because I study, uh, I study two systems. One is communism and the other is capitalism and they don't work both of them doesn't work. If you don't believe me, every, every few years, we got economic collapse. Every few years, because we haven't figured out how this works. Every few years, things get out of control. Rich gets too rich, poor gets too poor, and then comes a revolution. It doesn't work. So it's like uh, the economics, the money, how the money goes to, from people to people, it has an impact. On, on, on the very soul of the people. And uh, I don't want to mix one thing with the other, but yes, it has a big influence. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. To be honest too, I mean, I would tend to agree that, you know, both capitalism and communism haven't really been working. You know, we've had a lot of people who want power, a lot of people who want a lot of different uh, ways of, of controlling the way that this world works. Um, and I think that you have a really good insight there about how does the kingdom of God work? If this is what the Bible's talking about, right? You know, what does the kingdom of God mean? And I'm kind of pulling from uh, an author uh, by the name of John Cobb, who talks about Jesus as a third way. 
Mm -hmm. I was just reading his book, Jesus is Abba. And um, if you want good theological reading, I would encourage reading through him. Uh, he is quite a read. Um, and he talks about a Jesus of a third way that's not about changing radically the way that the system in the in the early Greek early Roman empire would have would have been asking for him like in other words like rooting up people killing emperors and moving forward or just trying to reform the actual system Jesus was talking about something radically different that I think is about the people the movement of people the creation of people that love within people that changes how we fundamentally work and we fundamentally change Jesus isn't talking about really a political movement in the light of let's go and tear down every single institutional structure. But I think what Jesus is talking about here is a kingdom that's talking really about the power of people, the power of love within ourselves to also change the way our systems work, change the way our world should function, and also as well the way that we should interact with one another as well, caring for those people. I think that that's really a Jesus that also talks about really caring for the person standing in front of us. And that's what I think the kingdom of God is trying to really establish there. It's this movement of the finances move us towards creating a world that actually says we care about these values but also at the same way as well, it's also saying we need to shed away what capital is trying to do, which is say, we want more. We wanna keep it for ourselves. Greed is a very hard thing to stop. And that's something that I always wrestle with. Me and my family have that fight all of the time. Where is the line between greed and health? And I honestly think that it is a hard road a really hard road to kind of say where that line gets gets drawn. And I think it really comes from this kingdom mentality that it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the other. And so I think Jesus is actually speaking to communism and to capitalism all at the same time saying, you guys have got parts, but not the fullness. Where is the love that actually comes through our people? And I think that's where Jesus would come from with that kind of perspective. That's where I call on that. What, what, what do others think? What do others believe on this question? This is a really interesting question, right? What do we do in the question of greed? <laughs> Oscar, you want to I, I got one more. <laughs> it's something that has got me really thinking because when the apostles, after Jesus resurrected and goes to heaven, the apostles come up and create an economic system in which every, everybody sells whatever they have and give it to the apostles, everything. And when I say everything, I mean, they give everything. So how did that work? How, I, mean, I was thinking, what do these people were doing? Mm. You sell everything, what's next? And they were really literally doing that mm. and they were, sending missionaries here, they were sending people here, they were taking care of the poor, taking care of the widows. I mean, they were doing the whole thing and nobody owns nothing and yet everything belongs to everybody. I mean, that's what the Bible says. How that works right now, I have no idea. But what I know they were Jewish and by that I mean they knew a few things that we don't know. We don't practice a few things. I don't know if that has an impact. But it was unique. I must say that was unique. I have no idea how that might work nowadays, but that was unique. Yeah, that's a very good question. Very insightful question, yes. Um, and very, very important question. I'm gonna open it up to others. What do others think about this? Yeah, go for it. Um, I was, I mean, I'm trying to, tie in several things. I think it's interesting, as Sarah mentioned, that it's a surprising passage to think about stewardship. And I was wondering, like, hmm, it's interesting that Mary would be the one to talk about it since she's a mother. And it made me think about 
like what does it mean to love anyway and what and where does and what happens when you expect something in return for love transactionality um and three is like because mary is saying it i feel like the first place we end up making people into instruments as oscar mentioned like we use people to work for us and hence um we have economic systems starts with in a way women and their bodies being used for a production literally production mm. and i think again it comes back to how we relate to a mother's love and how we relate to what we expect when we are loving someone and is there a give and take in those relationships and i think it for me it boils down to a question of what is love anyway i mean because if the economic logic is brought into love love cannot save you it's a very very good observation there transactionality i love that i love that you talk about that because i think that that's a very key part to this right you know it's we've transacted what it means to be in love what it means to care for someone else and i i picked this passage because of that issue right where this is coming from a woman who has given birth to the christ who's been actually told that she's not welcome at the actual inn she's been condemned by people within her own communities for having a child outside of outside of marriage and at, at the same time as well she's a refugee she's living in a in a town at this point that isn't hers and so this woman <laughs> who's coming from the lowest ranks of society is proclaiming this is who Christ is and i think that your point about transaction is beautiful because Yes, a mother's love is not about transaction. If we think about parents' love, right? It's it's not about what you give me is what I will give you back. It's I'm giving constantly. And I don't expect something back. But I do it because I simply love you. And does should the world work that way? How does the world work that way? Well, how do we get rid of these economic transactions? How do we get rid of the way that we think about that? Why we think about that? And so I really think Mary brings up a really good point to this. Just simply throw down the rich and bring up the poor. It's a tough conversation for some people. I think a lot of rich men might look at this passage and say, so Jesus is telling me to let it all go, <laughs> to give it all up. Uh, and I think honestly, what Jesus would say is what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount to um the man who actually approached him, what must I do to achieve salvation? And he responds, give away half of your riches and just follow me. And he walks away. He walks away from it. I think it's a tough message. I think it's a hard message. What does it mean to love someone so unconditionally that you're willing to give them everything? I don't know if people have watched Les, Les Mis before. Has, has, has anyone watched it? Oh, yeah. The whole part where the priest gives away more as, he, as, as he's walking away from his, from his home, stealing from him, he gives him more. Is that what our Christ is calling us to do? Is that what our savior is saying we should be willing to do? Because I know I struggle with that. I have a hard time saying, oh shoot, is that what love is all about? What did you want to say? I'm sorry, I saw your, your hand there. And I think I was like, I mean, another connection that I was thinking about was when Jesus tells that very good, but rather rich person that, you know, um, I know you're following the commandments, but, you know, you should just give away everything and follow me. And he says that the difficulty with which the rich will enter heaven is like a camel walking through the eye of a needle. And I had to stay with that passage for quite a bit because it took me a long time to understand. Like for a long time, I grew up thinking that, well, 
God doesn't like rich people because he condemned them with a lot of money, but I never really understood that maybe rich people were being tested on a different thing in a different way. Like their journey to God is very, very different from a poor person's journey to God or a woman's journey to God. Like a man's journey to God is very different from a woman's journey to God. And it made me wonder as to when Mary says, you know, God will take people down from their thrones, what that means for people in power and what the challenges they need to overcome to understand what it means to love. Because it's very enticing to hold on to that control or illusion of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, I want to just say that's a condemnation that rich people are bad, you know. Um, um, it, they do have perhaps different challenges than, than we do. But, um, I, I, you know, I'd like to think, and, and again, nobody's perfect, but, you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are people who have lots of wealth. And at least from my perhaps lack of a lot of knowledge, but have done a lot of good, a lot of philanthropic good in this world and continue to do so. So I, I think it's partly what are the talents you've been given and how can those talents be used to um, bring about God's kingdom on earth, you know, to use those terms. And then, but more personally, how do we as a community of Christians um, work together to do that? Because it's really hard no matter what, but doing it alone is, I don't think what, what we were intended to do. I think we were intended to work together. Uh, that's why we have a church, you know, rather than isolated people. Uh, and why we have organizations that find ways of doing good. You know, our friend Tom knows about organizations in Skid Row. And you might be not surprised to know that I think the United Methodist Women is one of those organizations that uh, ask us to give money for mission. And basically all of that money goes to mission because we're a volunteer group. We have to have some organizing principles and things like that. And we're just one example, you know. So, so it's, it's the combination of what we feel personally, but also how we find ways to work with others that share our, our goals, our visions, so that, so that we can make a bigger impact. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I think that power is a drug in certain ways, right? And it's, it's, it's hard to say, I'm willing to give it up. I mean, we're seeing it right now in our presidential politics, right? It, it's hard to say, I've lost and I need to hand power over now to someone else. I'm done, it's time for someone else to move forward. And I think that it's, it's a tough message. It's a hard message uh, in terms of when we think about about mission at this place where Christ is calling us to truly care, to be a community that cares for absolutely every person. You know, because the first thing I want to say is, well, hold on, boundaries. Hold on, there's something else here. You know, that's my initial thoughts, right? And Jesus here, Mary saying, no, let go of all that. It's a simplified thing. It's just caring for those that need to be cared for first. And I think that it's so simple that sometimes people are looking at it like, I need to add more addendums to it. <laughs> what does that mean if I have to care for this person and this person? It's hard. And it makes one person scratch their own heads thinking, what is the next steps then? What does it look like? What's the practical realities to that, right? Because I can just hear a lot of people saying, well, does that mean that I can't care about my own economics you know, my food and my things. I have to care about that person standing in front of my house asking for something. I think there's a measure to both there that says, you know, first, economically, you are in a position that says that you need that money so that you can pay for all of that stuff. So talking about transaction is a very fair analysis to that. But I think at the same time as well, Christ is saying, give what you can. And sometimes, you know, it might not be money. Isaiah talks about it, you know, we are all organs of this body. 
that are working together. Sometimes it means you contribute your own hands. I think about poll workers recently, right? Or I think about, you know, people who, uh, I don't know, you know, someone who takes care of our, of our, um, <laughs> our uh, breakfast table after a church, right? We all have our different, our different gifts. The church still needs money to conduct its own, its own mission because we live in that capitalistic world. But that money is always utilized first and foremost to do what Christ is calling us to do. And so, Sarah, I want to thank you for that. I think that's such an important point. Thank you. Who else has something to, to share? Can I jump in for a second? Go for it. Um, I, I concur with Sarah that this is a, it's a surprising uh, combination of topics to take Mary's Magnificat and locate it in the context of stewardship. Um, so I really appreciate the challenge of considering like an immediate economic um, response to the Magnificat. Because so often, you know, it's just meant, right, we sing it on Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is lovely, but it doesn't necessarily have practical ramifications for us uh, after that. And you've done a really good job, Phil, of giving us this idea that the Magnificon is is practical, um, and it's it's a rallying cry. the The piece that Romana said about love and how to avoid this sort of transactional nature of love, it's really challenging because almost all relationships wind up in some form of transactional analysis. You know, you do for me, I do for you. And there's a certain extent to which that's always true, right? Like that's what makes a relationship is some sense of back and forth. Oh, bye, love you. Um, <laughs> like that. Uh, <laughs> but the piece that I'm like really struck by is the idea that God models the sacrifice in becoming, like in the incarnation, God has already said, this is how much I love you. I will give up everything. I will, you know, bring myself low. Uh, I will become humble. The creator of heaven and earth is now embodied in a form that is limited and, you know, fragile and grouchy <laughs> and angry. Um, and I, I think that that gives us this example that this isn't just like a God telling us to do something like Jesus wants you to give away everything. And if you love money more than God, then you can't go to heaven. You know, it's, it's more than that because God gives us like, well, here's an avenue. Here's what I am willing to do for you, which is so consistent with God throughout scripture, right? Like God just constantly is literally falling all over God's own self to show up um, and no way more so than this. And it's not, necessarily transactional, but there is something there that involves responsibility, right? Like when God does this for us, now we have, and that's very Wesleyan too, right? Like the, we now have the responsibility to pay attention to that action, to respond to that action and to, you know, not pay it forward, but our, our lives should be different because of it. And I'd never really gotten all of that out of the Magnificat before. So thanks, Phil. Yeah, no, I, it's the Christmas Eve sermon. <laughs> Oh, I think it's I think it's more than that, right? You know, it's 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 a Christmas Eve that 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 calls for a rebirth of the way that we live our own lives. I think, Mandy, you really talk about it really perfectly right there. It's just it's a rebirth to how we should be living our own lives, and I think um, that's what Mary is calling us to do, right? You know, to remember what that resurrected Christ has done. If Christ can resurrect from this dead form, then we are called to be reborn in the image that Christ died for. Uh, and so I think it, it really does involve, you know, I always say this, um, you know, it involves putting a death to ourselves in certain ways and allowing for Christ to remake us in Christ's own image. And that is hard. It's putting away our, our egos in certain ways, putting away the way that we think about something and saying, I'm letting someone else permeate within me and change me completely. And I think that's something that I still struggle with. You know, what does it mean for me to say, okay, Lord, this is you, <laughs> but I want something out of it. 
and it's hard for me sometimes to say, okay, Lord, I'm just giving you the full reins of this. I'm letting it go. Uh, and, you know, as I have, think for me, right, when I, when I talk about Mary's song of praise, I see a woman who did that, who's praising that, who's elevating that to a whole new level and saying, my son, thank you. Thank you for dying for me because this is what our world needs. And Jesus was born to a, to a carpenter and, and a carpenter's wife. Jesus wasn't born to kings. It's a whole new way of looking at the world. And I think it's absolutely beautiful to think about it in this context of financial stewardship, because if we don't talk about what money means to each and every one of us, then we forget what Mary says when we're talking about lowering down our thrones and lifting up those that are right behind us. And I think that that's really, really hard to do. I think we forget who the people are right behind us because they are behind us. Yeah. Go for it, Oscar. Yes, I was thinking about being rich and the relationship with God. I think about Abraham, that Abraham was very rich, but his heart was not on the money because in the day of test, as God asked him, the test was to kill his son. He didn't ask him to give away the money because God knew that his heart was not in the money. It was in the love that he has for his son. And the question was, does Abraham loves God more than that son? So that was the test, not the money. So there is no problem with the money. The, the problem is when you love the money. Mm. That's the problem. And when do, you ask these people, give away the money, oh my God. <laughs> that's, that's the real problem. I think that that's a very fair and very good point. Mandy, did you want to say something? It's just something very quickly. I, Oscar, I, I think it's an excellent point that it's, it's clear what we are prone to worship, right? I, you've heard me say that a lot, but you know, Abraham's uh, true love of his life with his son, Isaac. And so that was the test was, what do you love? Who do you love? And who do you love more? Um, years ago, I was in a, the church I served in Atlanta, like paid a ton of money for a financial consultant to come in and like organize a stewardship campaign for us. It was the idea that like, if you spend, you know, X thousands of dollars, then you will get Y tens of thousands of dollars. So it seemed like a good deal. It did not work that way <laughs> at all. The one good thing that came out of that is maybe like the most like succinct way I've ever thought about stewardship, which is um, like the, the campaign slogan was, it's not about equal giving, it's about equal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I loved that because it, you know, as opposed to just talking about like the widow's might or, you know, the rich man who wouldn't give up half of anything. And even the criticism, Sarah, you pointed out that they're really generous billionaires. Um, someone pointed out this week that Dolly Parton would be a billionaire if she didn't give away so much money. Uh, and we all have her to thank for the vaccine, right? I'm getting my Dolly Parton vaccine as soon as possible. <laughs> I'm going to ask for it that way. I'm not going to accept any others. Um, I don't mean that. Uh, the idea that generosity and, and sacrifice are, are linked. And, you know, for, for one of us to give away a dollar seems like nothing. But for others of us, it's everything. And I think the thing I love about this the most is that it puts God's sacrifice into such stark terms because God's sacrifice in the incarnation is not equal. Like it is vastly more uh, self-deprecating uh, than any sacrifice we've been asked to offer. Um, and I, I think I find that most humbling. It's one of the things that like grounds my faith. Like I'm not I'm not asked to follow a God or a God in Christ who asks more of me than, than they are willing to give. Um, and that, that really, really hit home in this passage. It even has me thinking in very different ways. And I thought, yeah, 
Yeah. Equal sacrifice. I like that. That was a $10,000 stewardship campaign attempt. <laughs> Didn't raise that much money, but that slogan is so good. <laughs> I'll give it to you for free. No charge. <laughs> I think it's a really good one, though, because I think you have a really good point there about a Jesus who sacrificed Jesus himself on a cross for all of humanity. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But Jesus sacrificed Jesus himself. I think about how much Jesus requires now of me to going and caring for those that are different than me. <laughs> you know, if Jesus was willing to die, what am I willing to <laughs> put on my own cross? And I think it's a wonderful way of thinking about it in terms of equal sacrifice, because yeah, there is a sacrifice that has to be made for people who are not at this table people who aren't welcomed, people who are told a whole bunch of different stories that they're not welcome. And it becomes something new, something different. It's hard. It's hard work. It's really hard. And our church is in an interesting position. Uh, so many churches, um, much of the money went for property, you know, uh, and it was it seemed to be the important thing. You needed to have your, your church facility. Perhaps you needed to have a, you know, your fellowship hall. You needed to have a residence for your pastor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm not saying that was bad. I'm just saying that that was the model everywhere, whether it was Catholic or uh, Jewish or, you know, all these other religions. And I think we're in an in a era now where certainly our congregation, but not just our congregation, is saying, uh, where should our finances go? Maybe the edifice, I've heard of edifice complex, that's kind of a corny way of saying it, but maybe the edifice is not what really makes the church. And maybe we don't need to think about raising tons of money for a new um, facility when we maybe could think of a better way to raise money for other causes, but still have a way of operating as a community. You know, you don't throw away everything. You need some some ways to gather. You need some ways to worship. You need some ways to have fellowship and, and all of that. But uh, how much of that needs uh, a fancy building? Um, you know, we're, we're in an era where we're saying maybe not. Very good point about our own congregation and where our congregation is at. I think it's the most important part is to just kind of decipher where are we going with this. And so I'm glad, Sarah, that you brought that forward. Thank you. Oscar, did you want to say something? Yes. I have a good question. How come Jesus Christ, every time he met a poor person, how come he didn't say, took a rock and I'm going to make it a nugget of gold. I'll make you rich. <laughs> that will fix the problem. It didn't happen, sorry. Why not? What is the problem? Do you have to struggle to make money? Or and once, you, once you get the money to give it away, what's the deal? I mean, what's the deal with money? That's a really good point to bring up because a lot of people talk about that, right? In terms of struggling to get my own money. So why should I give it to someone else? You know, I've been hearing that a lot lately. Um, and I think that's a very fair thing to ask. If Jesus didn't do these things, maybe our priorities are to be somewhere else. Maybe it's not about the money. Maybe it's about where we, where, where we give our money, where we put our money. Jesus still needed money. Jesus had to live somewhere. <laughs> Jesus had to uh, travel from, from place to place needed money to travel in between all of those, all of those communities. The apostles talked about it too. They had to, they, they had to travel. They had to ask for money. I mean, there's, there are texts upon texts about different, uh, different uh, apostles who were asking for money. Uh, and it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's all about one thing. And one thing I, I think Paul says it extremely well in first Corinthians, I die for Jesus Christ. And so at the end of it, really, um, 
where do we put our money? Why does it matter? I think Sarah brought up a really good point about our local congregation and where it's where it's at, you know, and where right now we're looking at our empty parking lot and we're asking a very fundamental question. How does it serve our community for God's will? And I think that's the fundamental point for this. Jesus didn't turn bread into golden nuggets, not because he couldn't do it, but because it wasn't about the gold. It was about the bread serving as food for, the, for that person that didn't have food. And I think once we get it back down to basics, right? You know, Christian mission, I like to think about it in terms of coming back down to the basics of who we are as Christian disciples. And I think it's all about how we care for our neighbor and what our congregations are doing to care for that neighbor. And that, to me, I know that some people and some pastors might say it's too simple of a message. But I think for me, if we're not caring for that person, no one's going to listen to our message. Who's, who's going to call that good news? But I'm getting into a preaching moment, so I should... <laughs> Go for it. Um, what Oscar said and uh, about why didn't Jesus turn every pebble into gold and what you were saying about, um, wait, I just wrote it down. <laughs> what? I'm totally blanking on it. About, um, about the nature of money and the nature of giving and it made me think about what exactly is scarce that we need the money for you know the whole idea that we have we have to struggle for my own money so i'll not share it um and again going back to the economic question as to what is the nature of scarcity and i think it's really really compelling whenever jesus tells people you know you can just leave it you know, you can just leave it. And the question for me is always like, how do we know that we need the things that we think we need unless we part with them and really live without them? And the question is, I mean, my response is like, well, you know, if you leave it, there's no chance you'll come back and get it when you really do find out you do need it. And I think, and I want to know what you make of that leap of faith that is required to really let go, knowing that you might not get it back. I was thinking of um, being in India and seeing where Gandhi was assassinated. He was living in a quite lovely home. Uh, and so obviously he had, he had quote sponsors, unquote. He didn't have anything personally, but he had people who helped take care of him so that he could do the work that he needed to do. Uh, and his, uh, they had a display case that showed his worldly possessions when he died. And it was like, you know, a bowl, a stick, you know, a, a couple of garments, uh, very meager uh, things. but but he was taken care of by other people. Um, as I say, he was living in a very nice home. He had a very small room in that, high, that home. And, and Jesus had friends who took care of him. Uh, we've already alluded to that. Phil has already talked about, you know, uh, Mary and Martha, I think they were pretty well off. And when he visited them, uh, he had people who took care of them. The disciples would hope when they go into towns, that there would be someone in the town that would open their house to them and take care of them. Um, so I'm not quite sure where this is going, but, but I think it's, there is a point where giving away everything can lead to other solutions, but it's, it would be very scary uh, to do that without, I guess, having that in, internal commitment that, that this is really what I'm being called to do. And I'm going to trust that uh, my higher power is going to 
help me see the way through it so that I will be taken care of. Or Thomas Merton goes off and lives in a, in a, in a community where nobody talks. And that's how he find his way. Um, but, it, but making that leap of faith, as we call it, is uh, not easy. Andy, did you want to say something? I did. I just wanted to chime in on Oscar's question about why, I'm re it's a good question. Why yeah. didn't Jesus just turn rocks into gold? Um, and you know, what's funny is like, didn't, isn't that a piece of the temptation narrative, right? Right after Jesus is uh, baptized, he goes into the wilderness and he's tempted. And, uh, you know, the angel says, you know, you can do whatever you want, turn these rocks into bread, turn them into whatever you need. And Oscar, I'm wondering for all of us, if Jesus didn't do that, which he did not, what did he do in the face of need? He did, he healed. Yeah. He gave bread. Yeah. He, he gave wine too. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> and he uh, he give advice about life mm -hmm. he counseled the people i have a question wasn't the answer that jesus gave was it yeah was it it was like the body cannot survive on bread alone sorry the soul cannot survive on bread alone or mm -hmm. He said something that something cannot survive on bread alone. Man Man cannot live on bread alone, but in every <laughs> word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. What it means is that uh, life comes from from God. What do, what do others think? What are others? Th thinking about this question. Rumina, did you want to say something more? For me, that answer is just so compelling because it's like there is a different hunger that he's addressing. I mean, it is a hunger that is beyond that, that is beyond a physical, is beyond physical in nature. And it cannot be given, you cannot have a quick fix on it. And it's like something that is, oh, it's like going into um, conversations about a spiritual wound that we try to fix with physical or material band-aids and it just doesn't work. It's just one fix to another. And this is where I think that the most important part is Jesus really is a third way. Jesus isn't a second way. He's not a first way. He's something that nobody can really pin down and can say, you know, oh yeah, Jesus is clearly talking about a political revolution, but he, he didn't do that. But at the same time as well, Jesus wasn't cavorting with rich people and walking inside of those courts and saying, this is what people need. But Jesus is talking about something a little bit more than just that. You know, he's talking about where are the people? And how are these people being cared for? How are they being loved? How are they being mistreated? I mean, Paul went out there. Uh, if, you, if you guys ever get to read through First and Second Thessalonians, I mean, Paul was really getting out there and really talking about a point where, talking about completely destroying the whole way government works because it's not caring for its people. 99% in the Roman society were considered literally servants and so this is this is what i think jesus is talking about at this point it's like how do we bring down the rich bring ourselves to care for the actual poor where we see them where we provide for them where we care for them and where our, our society is made whole because i think without these pieces we're fragmented we're kind of missing things. We're missing components and we know it, we feel it. And so I think what Jesus is trying to say is how do we make our society whole again? How do we make it heal? How do we finally bring it back together? That's what I call God's creation. The wholeness of that. Yeah. Go for it, Oscar. Oh. 
Well, I recall being in a church in which every Saturday they told us you have to give your tithing and your offerings, and then you're gonna be blessed. You get money, you're gonna be blessed economically because you're giving to God. It was every, it, it, or they even have a song every, every Saturday. And it was, they said, you have to give to God so God can give to you. If you are poor, it's probably because you're not giving your first share to, to what, going back money to God. I mean, I'm talking about the tithing, and that that uh, passage from Malachi that uh, in which you says you have robbed me because you stealing my my tithing, and then he mentioned about four type of uh, blessing that might have if you give me money. I see in Malachi, but it's very interesting that uh, they enforce that in those churches that I know. But when I read when I read uh, the book of Acts. There is nothing that says that a Christian has to give a tithing. As a matter of fact, what he says, the Christian has to give everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, better than better than tithing, you get, but it's not happening. Doesn't give everything and not even give the tithing. <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> but that's what that's the truth. What they say, you are poor because you're not giving back to money back to God. You're not tithing. That's what this uh, mentality in these churches give. And then I met this church from Brazil in which you give money and they make miracles. And they say, give us your money. We'll do the miracle for you. Any miracle, any miracle. And that is what's going on in the uh, Hispanic population. This church has about 56 churches here in California, 56. And they tell you, give all your money, A-L-L, -L, all your money, and we'll give you the blessing that you're looking for. Healing, economic blessing, you name it. And that's what's going on in the Hispanic, uh, in Hispanic churches right now. It's called, it's, it's, a, it's a Brazil, it's a church from Brazil. And it makes fundamentally that blessing comes through money. And it's what well, you have to see it to believe what's going on. Imagine 56 churches or 55, something like that. That was 10 years ago. I don't know right now. So talking about money, it's good, good money, but I don't know. It's a, it's stretched to some level that I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. And I think the uh, like the piece of that in Acts, I, I've made reference to that a lot, thinking about, you know, when you're asked to give everything, the, the, the follow through, the, the only way that works is when you're in a community that can support and sustain you, right? Like it wasn't just give it away. It was give everything to the community so that everyone has what they need. And it's this sort of redistribution of wealth and access and provision and food. Um, this past week, Sarah sent me an article earlier today that was talking about canceling student loan debt, which is, it would be such a tremendous blessing uh, for so many people. It would absolutely be life-changing. Um, it is a way, it's a form of oppression that is just uh, much like medical debt, much like any debt, um, it becomes a prison. And I was seeing, you know, like the, some of the curious responses to it of people who were objecting, like, well, I paid mine off. Exactly. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, but I, mean, I, can, I, can, I can understand their logic. If they've scrimped and saved and for 20 years to pay the damn yeah. thing off and then somebody <laughs> else, you know, doesn't have to do anything. I mean, that's that's kind of the logic behind a lot of the don't you know don't support the poor as well i've worked hard yeah. why don't why should why should they get something for nothing yeah but then you know one of the best responses i saw landed it in terms of like a church potluck well, y'all you come to a potluck and you don't bring food for 50 but you feed 50 
you bring a casserole. And if you can't bring a casserole, you bring napkins. And it doesn't matter. No one asks, no one cares. There's going to be the casserole people and there's going to be the napkin people. Everyone shows up with something. And maybe you wind up eating too many carbs, but you're full. <laughs> and everyone gets something to eat. And it this is how it's meant to work. And it's so funny that like we have this like internal disconnect. That we can't just give our money away unless there is this understanding that it's going to be shared. Like, okay, well, I'll give away everything if I know that my family and I are still going to be able to eat and live safely, right? Like when we all take care of each other, that model works exceptionally well. It turns out people can be really generous when they're not threatened. Um, but we've created a system and structure in capitalism that is incredibly threatening <laughs> and it doesn't benefit that's, that's generosity. The we have with, with going to, to a social democratic, you know, mm -hmm. it, they, they see it as, you know, you're stealing from me to take care of those who won't, who won't do their fair share. And I don't know how we get out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it starts with this conversation of acts. Mm -hmm. Maybe it starts there. We talk about how we care for other people, how, you know, I love that thing uh, that uh, you talked about in terms of a potluck. Uh, Cause I, I'm just, just like, I've never heard that. It's like, oh, I'm going to use that now because it's like talking about Jesus's love is like a potluck. We bring something to it. And at the end, everyone is satisfied. Well, Even though it might, you know, might need a little bit of tweaking here and there, you know, but at, at, at the end of it all, you know, it works. It cares for everyone. And still, you know, I've been, look, I went to where we had six green bean casseroles and that was it. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> oh, else. I don't see your problem. Nobody <laughs> Nobody <laughs> that is a vehicle for those fried onions. I have zero issues with that. <laughs> Lee, I think you also bring up a really good question about how we, how we get out of the world that we are in right now. I know it, it's is, really frustrating. On the end, about charity versus an institutional support for people who need it. Exactly. And I think it's it's a hard, it's a hard cycle to break. But honestly, this is why I believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> You know, I believe in someone who holds a foundation for me for why I'm willing to do what I'm what I want to do for this for this world. And I think honestly, the only response I can think of now these days has just been to share what I believe in terms of my Christian love and hope to God, hope and faith that maybe other people will start hearing that message as well and will hopefully bring a common ground to that. Right, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Congresswoman for New York, talked about that on the on the House floor about a month ago, I think, about creation care, about how we care for our own environment. And she talked, she invoked the name of Jesus about someone who is trying in every sense of the word to say, my Jesus is calling me to care for this world. We can't drill in these areas. Mm. I think that that's where it starts, right? Because I remember reading on Twitter all of those responses to her message and it was all one message of, oh my God, I'd never thought of it this way. Um, that our foundations mean something for the actual world, practical implications for it. And so I, I really come back to how we live inside of the world and how we share that message with everyone around us eventually someone will say, wow, that's an infectious thing. I want to be a part of that. Maybe I should join. Maybe I should care for that. And that's where I think it starts. But that's me, you know, other people might have other opinions about how that, how that works. And it's not, an, it's not an easy message, you know. And as Jesus says, you know, it, it's not going to be one that's going to make you friends. It's going to make you a lot of enemies. And that's hard. It's hard to be in a continuous minority that is speaking from the margins saying, this is what the world should be. And I'm thinking about that in today's world as well, you know. What does it mean to constantly be screaming from the margins? 
asking for change, but change doesn't fundamentally happen. It's piecemeal. The hard journey. So I'm gonna say that, you know, it's, it's getting to be seven o'clock at night now. So I wanna be cognizant of people's time. Uh, does anyone else have some parting, some parting thoughts that they want to share? I just, uh, one of the ways that I experience uh, giving, and it's not that hard, is um, just listening to people that you don't know and um, maybe that are in a tough situation um, and just asking them their name and taking a moment to not be in a rush to go somewhere. So even if you don't have something to give financially or if you just choose not to do that because you don't know where it might go, at, you know, if it's in one of those situations under a bridge or whatever, I think just taking the opportunity to listen is probably one of the best gifts or at least a small thing that we could each do that doesn't take a lot of brain power. You just open your ears and heart. So Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. Taking time to hear someone. Anyone else? Well, just basically leading by example. That's what we have to do. I mean, the power of love and faith is tremendous. The older I get, I, I, I sort of visualize where I started as a child and where I am now. It gets easier along the way and it becomes more important. And listening to everybody and the common thread through the Bible of, you know, give it all up and follow me and, um, you know, take down the rich and, and all of these comments. I, I don't ever see it literally as, is a literal thing, but it, he has to be first and our actions have to consider him first and how we are in this ministry and how we react to people and show our faith. That has to be more important. Just like Mandy mentioned Dolly. I mean, to me, a wonderful Christian, wonderful, faithful person and very giving. She can have all of that, but still God is first. And, and I just, so I don't think it's really having to give up everything that you have, but it can't be important. Or like Mandy says, worshiping something other than what's important. So um, what, you know, worshiping God. So um, I just think that it, and like you said, um, eventually, when you keep doing it, people will follow. They'll say, look at that. I want to be like that. I mean, I have experienced that in my life where somebody just stands out to me in one of the law firms I worked at. I'm like, why, what is with this person? I mean, and it drew me to investigate. Um, I think that, uh, you know, just like the song, they'll know we're Christians. Um, it's, I, I don't, I think that's the best way to do it. They'll know that we are Christians. Yep. Who else has anything they'd like to share? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for contributing and being a part of this Bible study. I appreciate it, everyone. You guys are all wonderful. You guys all make my heart flurry. Uh, so I love you all. You guys are my home church, uh, and it's been such a wonderful conversation. Uh, I had a detailed Bible study plan, which is required for the Board of Ordained Ministry, and uh, it went in a totally different direction than how I had written it, and I love that. So thank you all. Thank you all for bringing this, you, yourselves and bringing all of your questions, because it's making me think so much about this, and I love that. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye all. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, real quick, Dolly, did you see that Dolly is going to, I think, do public service announcements to encourage people to do? Yes. Take that, and you know the last person who did that? Jimmy Carter. Elvis no. for the polio vaccine. Elvis? Elvis. Uh, 
Same okay. situation. People were hesitant to take the vaccine and Elvis did public service announcements about the polio vaccine. That's fantastic. In the 50s. And so now Dolly's going to continue the tr tradition. Of Tennessee musicians. Dolly's done a lot with literacy over many years. Oh, uh, yeah as Rotary has. So Rotary and Dolly have had some interactions uh, supporting literacy programs. She's, she's a good person. Yeah, I worked at Dollywood. Oh my gosh. Did you? <laughs> I want to go there. I was a dancer at Dollywood. I was a clogger yes. at the train depot. <laughs> wow. Awesome. I can't be lying. This is 100% true. Um, okay. and I never got to meet her. What preceded Dollywood at that on that at that site? What was Silver it? Dollar City. Okay, I was at it when it was still Silver Dollar City. Yeah, yeah. I remember that vaguely. Well, um, when I went to that World's Fair in um, Knoxville, nineteen eighty-two. Nineteen 